Please find in your Bibles Romans chapter 12. Let me make one final announcement that I, I uh, passed over earlier. You may notice on the back of the church bulletin there's a little bit of a note about parking. And yeah, so we've were asked by the building down there not to park over there. And I think it's because of I don't think it has anything to do with us, but they did write us a letter about it. And so, you know, it's no problem for us to just park in the places where we're allowed to park. And so there are green check marks on the back of the bulletin with a map to tell you where you can park. And so uh, Brother Lee and I were actually discussing this. It's just kind of funny when you, when you deal with people. Anytime I try to explain something, inevitably somebody has a question like, well, you know, can we park here? I'm just telling you there are green check marks in the places where we're allowed to park. And there's a map on it. And so uh, if you're driving, you're an adult. And so you know how to get to those spots. So please don't ask me questions about parking. That's that's my plea. Lee and I are both talking about it. So you know, people are going to come and they're going to ask, well, Pastor, what about? Please don't ask me what about. There are green check marks in the spots where we can park, and there's plenty of parking, lots and lots of it in those spots. So please park in those places. And uh, if, if uh, you need to, it's fine to park out front here at the church parking lot. We would ask that anyone who's able-bodied not use the parking spots in front of here and the reason for that being is that you know you never know some services will have you know we'll have so many vehicles that our, our visitors would need all the front parking spots or folks that would have disabilities that would make it not as easy for them or even impossible to come across so we want to just take care of that shouldn't be a problem at all and everything's laid out on the church bulletin where we can park I forgot to mention that this morning by way of announcement so uh, there you go all the questions are answered in the bulletin I know you're just dying to ask me a question about it. Like, well, Pastor, what about? You're going to ask me, what about something about the parking? And I'm not going to answer. I told Leah, I said, you know, I'm just going to, I'm going to, like, hold the line. No answering questions about parking. Uh, the information is there. Interpret it. If you can't read, Charlie's always available uh, to read. And you can ask Charlie any question you want to about, about anything, by the way. And you can ask for an answer in whatever language you like it in. So... Uh, he's, he's not quite fluent in Swahili. He's been wasting his time learning Portuguese recently. I don't know exactly why he's interested in that language, but uh, he's been spending a lot of time with Portuguese which uh, when he needs to be learning Swahili or brushing up on his Swahili. So anyway, you may want to ask him in Swahili so that he gives proper priority. All right, I'm being silly, and now I want to be serious because we're looking at the Word of God. And so you found Romans chapter 12 in the Scripture, and we are in the uh, transition again today. I would like to begin reading in verse 3. And, and we're actually going to read today down to verse 8. We won't have time to go past this. And so we're going to read, we have a couple preliminary remarks, and we're going to get into the practical application of the Scripture here. And, and this is so practical. This portion of the Scripture, I believe, if you allow it to, will not only help you, but will actually be life-changing. Tony, I just got a notification that you're live-streaming. So I guess you're, you're, you're on Facebook right now. Huh? Okay, thanks a lot. Verse 3. For I say, through the grace given unto me to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. For as we have many members in one body, and all members have not the same office, so we being many are one body in Christ, and every one members one of another, having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, whether prophecy, let us prophesy according to the proportion of faith, or ministry, let us wait on our ministry, or he that teacheth on teaching, or he that exhorteth on exhortation, he that giveth, let him do it with simplicity. He that ruleth, with diligence. He that showeth mercy, with cheerfulness. And then verse 9. Let love be without dissimulation. Abhor that which is evil. Cleave to that which is good. And this is an ever so helpful portion of the Scripture. Let's pray and ask God to help us make application from it. God, this morning we would be in danger of... One, thinking because many of us have even memorized this portion of Scripture, that we already know it, and that there wouldn't be things that we would have room for improvement or areas where we could learn things that perhaps we've never thought of before. So I pray that you would help us to have open minds. If, 
this is a portion of Scripture that we're familiar with this morning. But God, more than that, Lord, we need to live out practically Your Word. And it's so vital for us to, to live out our faith and to have our lives have purpose. And this is a purpose passage of the Scripture that we need to understand as believers. And so I pray that You would, first of all, foster a desire in us. Lord, just a flaming desire in us that wants to know wants to know how that we could live more in a way that would please you and in a way that would render better results in our lives as well, Father, as having eternal results for both us and for others. And I pray that you bless the, the preaching of your word this morning. We ask for the power of your Holy Spirit now. We know that you promised that you're in the midst of us this morning. And Father, we need your Holy Spirit to be the, the personality that has the preeminence this morning. We ask for that and invite that as well. In Jesus' name we pray it. Amen. Well, this is the passage of Scripture. As a matter of fact, Brother Tim preached it uh, when he was here for revival services the other night. I thought this is not right for him to jump right in the middle of a series when I'm preaching. I'm, you know, two weeks I'm going to be preaching Romans 12, and then he goes and preaches it last Sunday. It wasn't right at all. And so you call him up, or you send him an email, or let him know that you formally complain, or just tell him Pastor Price preached it better than you did. That's, <laughs> that'd be even better. All right. Anyway, uh, but uh, actually, I'm really glad that he preached it because. The, what he preached was what the text is saying, but there's so much in a text that you can't preach everything. So it's a real help. But here we are in a transitional phrase or part of Romans. And when we begin chapter 12, we see, And I beseech you, therefore, or I'm pleading with you, or I'm earnestly be begging you, brethren. And it is application, therefore. I beseech you, therefore. Well, the therefore, of course, we know, references everything that the Apostle has been used under the influence of the Holy Spirit to teach up to this point. And we've just finished with what is God doing in Israel? What is God doing today with the Jews? And the answer to that question, by the way, what is God doing in Israel today? Nothing. Nothing. God's working in His church today. That's and that's great. one of the things that uh, Paul has really hammered home. God is going to work with Israel someday. And all of Israel is going to be saved. But today, my friend, anyone in Israel who is saved is saved the same way the Gentiles are. Those branches have been cut off. And if they're going to be part of God's plan, they're going to be grafted in to the, the branch or to the, to the tree, which is not wild or contrary by nature, and the wild branches. So the branches which should have been part of the vine, they can be grafted in. And the branches which should have been wild are being grafted in. They're the Gentile branches. And because, and this is a, uh, if you will, this is a fulfillment of God's promise in Deuteronomy 32, 21, when God said, this is what's going to happen to Israel if you're not faithful to me. But through that, all of, through that, the Gentile nations will be saved. And my friend, I just want to remind you of what we saw last week, is that if you're involved in a program that isn't God's program, first of all, God isn't blessing it. Second of all, God isn't doing it. And third of all, it's futile. In other words, there are so many believers who are so caught up in Israel today, and I'll just be honest with you, God's working in the church today. The Scripture is very clear about that. And it's amazing to me how much headway uh, movements which ignore what God is doing and yet substitute for something else. In other words, this is how we're going to reach people. I'll tell you God's method for reaching people. God's method for reaching people involves three instruments. His Word, His Spirit, and a preacher. Right? In other words, anytime somebody gets saved, they get saved because of what God's Word says. You don't know who God is. You don't know anything about God without God's Word. Anything else is something somebody's telling you, and you have no way of confirming that God actually said it. And His Spirit confirms it. Isn't that wonderful? I love this series on origins Brother Taj is in right now. You know how you can know that God created the world? Yeah, you could just really know it. What? You can just look, but how do you know what to believe? Well, God says, that's real. It's amazing how many times I've told people truth and I said, and you know it because God's shown it to you. And I had the same person just say, hmm. you'd be amazed at how many times you could argue and go round and round and round and round with all kinds of facts and all kinds of things that are true, and yet that doesn't convince anyone, yet the Holy Spirit's the convincer. When, when the Holy Spirit begins to do a work on a person, on a lost person, they can... They can have all the arguments, all the whatever they want to have, but it's amazing the power of the gospel and the power of God's Holy Spirit to just convince somebody of truth. I have personally led many individuals who claim to not believe there's a God, 
who claim to not believe that there's right and wrong, but they're simply they're hearing the Word of God and just saying to them, you know, it's true, the Holy Spirit tells you so. And uh, they've, they've said, yeah. Matter of fact, hey, if, you're, if you're interested in being an effective soul winner, you need, to, uh, you need to understand what's going on when you're preaching the gospel with people. I've many times looked at somebody, and I can see that the Holy Spirit's doing a work. And I'll just say, you know what you're feeling right now? That's supernatural, isn't it? That's God's Spirit talking to you right now. And that's why, that's why you know, this person, the Bible calls it foolishness of preaching, and it's the preacher that's foolish. And it's amazing, you know, you read uh, what God chose, chooses to confound the wise and to confound the mighty. It's just foolish preachers. That's why a person who doesn't necessarily have to have great intellect can just have a simple message from God's Word, and God's Holy Spirit will confirm it, and they'll know it's true, and they'll be able to believe it. So what's necessary to, for the gospel to be preached? Well, God's Word, and God uses foolish people. And there, you know, there aren't any, in comparison with God, God doesn't have wise people to use. So He uses foolish people. So His Word, a foolish person, and His Holy Spirit. And that's how I got saved, and that's how you get saved, and you, you were saved, and that's how anyone who gets saved is. And what is God using to preach the gospel? His church. His church. That's, that's part of the Great Commission. It's very, very practical. Uh, it's interesting. The Bible just talks in, in Acts chapter 2 about the church. And when they, the individuals, when, when Peter stood up in power and preached the gospel on the day of Pentecost, the Bible says they were added unto them. Well, added unto what? Added unto them what? Well, believers. That was the church of Jerusalem that that was added to that day. And so when people got saved and they got baptized, they were added to the church. And the Lord added to the church daily, such as should have been saved. And so what, what is God using? He's using the gospel. And where, and where is God using it? Through the church. I am for any plan to share the gospel. Aren't you? I mean, I, I'm fine with anybody that just wants to go out and preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. I'm just fine with it. I don't have an objection to it. Uh, some of you folks are on vacation today. It's okay to preach the gospel in Fort Lauderdale or wherever you go. It's okay. You don't have to just preach it. Well, they can't go to my church. Well, they could, they could come to this church, but you might be in a place they couldn't come to Fort Lauderdale Baptist Church. Preach the gospel. Uh, we saw it happen with Philip. And boy, there was a church established in Ethiopia as a result of that, which was responsible in many ways for the preservation of the Scripture that we hold in our hands today. And so God uses the preaching of the Gospel, but He uses it through the church. Jesus Christ established His church. God's all about it. And I, 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 make a, I emphasize it a lot because it's de-emphasized too much. Too much. Too many times people say, well, I don't do church. I, I just, it's funny to me how many times lost people, but especially Christians, redefine what, what a church is. And what the worship service or the worship uh, element of the church is. I've had people say, well, the ch I have church in me. And I just think, well, you probably have a multi personality disorder then. Because, you know, the fact is, church isn't in you. Or this is my church. You ever had somebody say, this is my church? And I've heard some pretty crazy stuff when people say, this is my church. And in their minds, it's their worship. In other words, when I feed the homeless, that's my church. I've heard that a lot of times. When I, when I do charity, that's my church. Well, that isn't what church is. And we're going to see that in our text, in our passage today. But we saw the last several weeks, we've, we've seen the theme that's, that begins in, in Romans. There's several themes in Romans. But really the, the underlying theme that have, we've been looking at from a lot of different angles all the way through our series so far has been this matter of to the Jew first and also to the Greek. In other words, this church at Rome is comprised with Jews who brought the gospel there and Greeks who received it, and there's a confusion in the church between the Jews and the Greeks about how Jewish their, the gospel is. In other words, what about the law? When a, when, a, when a Jewish believer preaches the gospel, his expectation is that a saved Gentile is just going to be like him. And, uh, you know, circumcision is a requirement, and the law of Moses, and a lot of these things. And we saw very, very clearly in the Scripture there is one law that is necessary for salvation, and it is the law of faith. The law of faith. And the great illustration, Paul used a lot of illustrations to show that the law doesn't save, but the great illustration that he used was the illustration of Abraham's salvation mentioned in Genesis 15. He said Abraham believed God, and his faith was counted him for righteousness. And the argument was, if Abraham were saved by faith, uh, how much of Moses' law was in effect, and part of his salvation. Moses wasn't born from the loins of Abraham yet. 
And so he was a descendant of Abraham. So if salvation was by faith with Abraham, salvation has always been by faith. That's the argument of the Scripture. And it's a good one, by the way. It's a good one, really, is a, is a settler. And then the question was, well, what about the law? Because the Gentiles are, ha! Get that law out of here. We're not under a law. Well, we know that all Scripture is profitable, don't we? For doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. So we know that there has to be some good in the law. But the Bible says about the law, and one of the benefits of it is that it makes sin exceeding sinful. In other words, Romans chapter 5 says, nevertheless, death reigned from Adam until Moses. In other words, people died before before Moses. Why did they die? Sin. Did they have a law to tell them exactly what all the sins were? No. But the law, the Bible says, entered that sin might be exceeding sinful. And so the law is a real help. And I'm okay with it. I, the law isn't the means to preach salvation, but I'm fine with showing people the law. This is what God requires for you to be sinlessly perfect. It's just fine to use that. And the Ten Commandments are enough to help with that. But my friend, the Ten Commandments don't save anyone. The Ten Commandments help people to realize they're lost. They help sin to be exceedingly sinful. People will die whether they know the Ten Commandments or not because they're born with the sin curse and uh, they're sinners, whether they're fully aware of all their sin or not. And by the way, as Christians, as you study God's Word, isn't it true that you become more aware about sin? Uh, you know, I had somebody this last week ask me about, Pastor, you know, why don't you have a problem with all these things in the life of a new believer? And I just told him, you know, there's no way in the world a new believer could know all the things that God calls sin. They've got to grow in the Lord. And a, a person who is yielded can grow extremely fast, but you're never at the place where God can't show you something. God can't show you truth. And you, if you think you're at that place, my friend, you're at a place where you're not growing, but there's a lot for you to learn if you would learn, if you would listen. And so now we come to the conclusion, and Paul said, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. To whom is he addressing in the church at Rome? Believers, Believers who are comprised of Jews and, Gentiles. Jews and Gentiles. And this is a bringing them together moment. This is a moment where, hey, you may be Jews, you may be Gentiles who are saved because of the gospel which was preached to you by the Jews, but the real important point, whether you're Jew or Gentile, is that you're God's. That is, you're owned and possessed by God. And Paul said, I would beg you. You know, one of the things that bothers me the most when believers have disputes or they're... You know, I, I'm, I love it when Christians want to study Bible doctrine and find out truth and they have a desire to learn it. But you know, some Christians are more about looking at and resting or wrestling with doctrine than they are involved with practicing and living out their faith. And sometimes it troubles me that Christians, and oftentimes it's true, when Christians have a problem, a spat, or a dispute with each other, it's almost universally true that they're not a living sacrifice. In other words, if you have time to argue with another believer about something or have an issue with someone's background or where someone's coming from or something that really is just a difference, uh, not something that's doctrinal. If you, have if you have time for that and you have a person trying to figure out who's right and who's wrong about the thing, it's almost certain that you're not doing something to uh, preach the gospel and to fulfill God's purpose. Now, I'm not saying we should not uh, earnestly contend for the faith. Uh, I'm not saying that Christians are never contentious. And that you ought to be... Isn't it strange, isn't it interesting that people think that when you uh, contend for the faith that you should never argue or be contentious about it? That always strikes me as strange because you can't contend without being contentious. In other words, a person wrong is always going to feel um, as though they're being attacked when, they're, when truth is presented to them. Isn't it so? Mm -hmm. It's amazing how false teachers always, oh, you're so mean about it. And yet, here they are calling you mean. That's not nice to call somebody mean. You ever notice that? The person who's a troublemaker always says, oh, they are so, and they attack the person instead of dealing with the truth that's behind I'll just tell you something, my friend. You cannot present truth to somebody who's in error without there being a conflict between truth and error. Isn't it so? Yes. And so we know that to contend for the faith, you would seem contentious, not mean-spirited, not in the flesh, but it's when you're wrong, it doesn't feel good to be wrong. It doesn't feel good to be correct and so forth. That needs to be in the church, doesn't it? Getting things right and, and uh, for us to desire to be holy and to desire to be right about God's Word. But my friend, I'm going to tell you something. There ought to be far less time spent contending for the faith than there is just being a living sacrifice. And people who are a living sacrifice don't have a will, do they? 
Uh, I, we could preach messages this morning, but I think probably if I were to ask for a show of hands, how many of you have heard a message preached about being a living sacrifice from Romans 12? Probably all of us in here have. Uh, most of us have. So let me just say, uh, let's begin our introduction with all those messages you've heard. There you go. Uh, if you'll just call, you know, bring them up to memory and recognize that you ought to be a living sacrifice. It's your reasonable service. You're not supposed to be conformed to the world, but you're supposed to be transformed. And let's get into the practical aspect of it. We're supposed to prove what is that good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. Don't you love that phrase? You ever noticed the, the phrase, it's not the perfect will of God, it's the good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. All three of those adjectives describe God's will. God's will is good, God's will is acceptable, and God's will is perfect. I'll just be honest with you, this last week trying to help Christians, I've had people tell me that God's will is not acceptable. I have. I had people say, well, I know that's what the Bible says, but I, don't, I can't do that. I just believe I'm right about this. That's saying God's will isn't acceptable. It's saying God's will isn't good, and that's saying God's will isn't perfect. In other words, I cannot accept what the Scripture says. It's too bad. It's too bad, but a person who is a living sacrifice knows that God's will is good, perfect, and acceptable. That isn't the message today, but it's important for us to have by way of introduction. Verse 3, Paul said this, and boy, this is important. This will really help us. For I say through the grace given unto me, to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think. Boy, that's a good statement, isn't it? Isn't that helpful? Not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think. You know, a good word to describe this statement would be the word humility. I have a personal definition for humility that I think is helpful. You know, sometimes people think humility is, you know, putting off praise or telling people, well, you know, I'm not. You know what humility is? Seeing yourself the way God sees you. I mean, it's just, it's just realizing uh, not that you're... Um, it's just realizing that you're less. In other words, a person who has humility isn't pretending to be less. He's a person who knows exactly what he is. And that is undeserving of the grace of God, not better than anyone else when it comes to that grace of God. And a person who understands humility is just what he is. Humility helps me a great deal not to be too impressed with others and not to be too impressed with myself. I try by God's grace not to be too impressed with others. I think it's a danger in Christianity. Sometimes you know, someone will be introduced and you say, oh, this is so-and-so. And they'll get, roll out the credentials and the, you know, the degrees and the titles and all these things and talk about what the person's done. And if that person has done anything for God, he's done it by the grace of God with the power of God. And so if you think that person's something, I mean, hey, you ought to love the person because of the brother in Christ. You ought to admire that somebody uh, is faithful to the Lord. But you ought to be impressed by it. You ought to be impressed by that person's God who's done great things. Um, I don't want to get into a caveat or distraction, but you may notice it. There, there isn't really room for it here, but you may notice that we don't have a platform presence in our church. We don't have thrones for men to sit on. Uh, yeah, have you ever been in a church with thrones? Yes. Uh, they look like thrones, don't they? And I'm not picking on you if that's your church. I don't have an opinion about any church except for this one. But they've got thrones on the platform, you know, fancier chairs anyone else sits in. And if you have a speaker or, or even just somebody, I've been to church and I'm like, why is that guy sitting there? He didn't do anything the whole service, but there's a line of like nine chairs, you know, and he's there. And it's like to let you know that he's a platform presence. That, in other words, he's a person of some importance. And you say, Pastor, that isn't really what it means. Yeah, it actually is. At least that's how it's perceived. And you may notice that we don't have that in our church, and the reason for it is we don't have any important people here. It's really true. We just don't have any important people here. You say, well, what about Tony? Well, I don't know what to say about Tony, to be honest with you, but I'm just telling you, we don't have any important people here. We have people who oughtn't to think of themselves any more highly than they ought to think, and we shouldn't do things that cause us to think, well, I'm a platform presence. It's too bad sometimes when people think that their behavior is acceptable because of a title that they have. In other words, they're unchristlike, and for whatever reason, it's don't you question me because I am, and they reference a title. And uh, my friend, I understand having an honor where honor is due, but honor doesn't honor wrong, and I've seen wrong honored sometimes because of platform presence. Don't think of yourself more highly than you ought to think. By the way, it won't bother you if somebody doesn't think anything of you at all, if you don't think anything of you at all. You know, have you ever felt like, you know, somebody doesn't appreciate you, or they, they need to know who I am? You know, like the guy, he doesn't know who I am. Uh, years ago, uh, a lady who used to go to our church, worked in a medical office, and had somebody really mean that came in, and the guy kept saying, do you know who I am? And so I taught her kids. 
to do that. You know, say, do you know who I am? Do you know who I am? And the answer is, no, I don't. Probably nobody else does either, <laughs> but you evidently do. You know, who are you? Well, you know what I, who I am? I am an individual who needed the gospel because right. I was ungodly. Amen. And I am a person who needs God's grace because without, without Him, you can do nothing. Without me, you can do nothing, Jesus said. So that's who I am. I'm a person who's very, very extremely needy. And so are you. So is anybody who is in Jesus Christ. So don't think of yourself more highly than you ought to think. It's amazing how easy it is to get along with people that don't think too much of themselves. I'm not talking about a self-esteem complex. That is thinking too much about yourself. I'm talking about a person who says, you know what, by God's grace, everything that I need is in Jesus Christ. Everything I have is through the blood of Jesus, and I have everything that I need. I'm okay. And so I don't need accolades or respect. You need respect from a person, my friend. You're not comprehending God's love for you the way in the fullness that you ought to. Okay, let's make a couple of points before we before we finish up here this morning. I want to really introduce ourselves to how to practically do these things. We're supposed to present our bodies a living sacrifice. It's reasonable. We're not supposed to be conformed to the world. We're not supposed to think of ourselves more highly than we ought to think. But looking at verse 4, the Bible says, For as we have many members in one body, and all members have not the same office, Paul here is pointing out by the help of the Holy Spirit that everybody's different. Nobody's the same. And praise God for that. By the way, be okay with people being different. There's a difference between being different doctrinally and being different on the basis of just who you are, who you're made to be, what you have, what you possess with regard to what's up here and so forth. Uh, the reality of it is God makes us all different. And it says we have many members and we don't have the same office. But, verse 5, so we being many are one body in Christ and every one members one of another. And here Paul is pointing out how important every part of the body of Christ is. He says we're, we're many members in one body and we're not the same, but he says we are one body. And so we're the same church. We're part of the same body. Isn't that an important, isn't that important uh, realization that people are different, but people are all the same or part of the same bar, part of the body? Other portions of the Scripture explain, you know, using the illustration and. Uh, by the way, let me waste a, just another few seconds of your time, if you will, please. The first time I ever tried to preach, Romans chapter 12, it took two hours. I'm serious. I tried to preach on spiritual gifts. And, you know, to preach Romans 12, you really have to go to 1 Corinthians 12, 13, and 14. And then you can't just stop in the middle of it. You've got to finish it. And uh, poor folks nearly died. And so I'm not going to do that to you this morning. It'll be probably one hour, 45 minutes, or something like that. <laughs> Way less in two hours, so in case you're a little frightened right now, uh, well, you, you should be. This is I have a terrible track record preaching this portion of the Scripture. Now, that was, uh, I think, about uh, 13 years ago that I did that. But, hey, let's we'll see what happens this morning. And I hope to encourage you. Now, <laughs> let's look at spiritual gifts. The Bible says, because we're all different, every one of us is important, every one of us is different. Verse 6, having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, whether prophecy, and then it goes into it. Okay, I want to look at that statement, having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us. And we're, probably, we're not going to go through all the gifts this morning. We're going to start in the gifts this morning. And so that's really where we're introducing this concept. The Bible says that, though, that we have gifts that are differing according to the grace that is given to us. Does everybody here understand what grace is today? I know that recent years that the false doctrine of Calvinism has been redefined as the doctrines of grace. In other words, that God preselects, predetermines the outcome of individuals to go to heaven or to go to hell. My friend, grace is grace, that's Calvinism. Okay, does everybody understand? You know, Calvinism's Calvinism, and grace is God's supernatural power. And grace has a lot of different contexts in the Scripture, actually. Uh, there's the grace of God that gives us salvation that's appeared to all men. And uh, there's um, God's grace for spiritual gifts. There's the grace that Paul was promised was sufficient for him. Remember when he had a thorn in his flesh and he asked God? He asked God to remove that thorn in the flesh, and God said to him, My grace is sufficient for you. And Paul's prayer was changed from God remove my thorn in the flesh to God I'd rather have your grace to have a weakness in which your strength is shown forth. So could we define today grace being God's strength? Could we just say it that way? 
I know we people there's an acrostic God's riches at Christ's expense. But can we also say about grace that grace is not for a lost person, grace is for a person who's received Jesus as their Savior? Can we agree on that? In other words, grace is God's power, God's strength. According to this, and according to many every context you study grace in, grace is God's ability to do what you couldn't do yourself. So, uh, grace does have many different contexts, but here we find that the Bible says, having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us. Here's a point I want to make. It's very vitally important for us with regard to spiritual gifts and service for the Lord Jesus, not to require, not to, not to require, not to rely on human strength or ability. It's bothersome to me, actually, that it has been for years so popular in churches to try to determine a person's spiritual gifts through an aptitude test. Brother, you're a pilot. Have you taken an aptitude test? Like when you work for a company? You have, right? Isn't it identical to a spiritual... you ever taken a spiritual gifts test? Okay. Well, you've taken an aptitude test, which is the same. But there are preachers who will go to churches, and uh, I know all pilots usually. Military people take aptitude tests, basically, and it kind of places them, shows what you'd be good at and what you wouldn't be good at, kind of evaluates your personality, your leadership abilities, and you know what your strengths are and what your weaknesses are. And uh, a lot of companies have aptitude tests for placement, right? For employee placement. We do the same thing a lot of times in the church. In other words, we take and give somebody a spiritual gift. What do you like to give? Are you, you know, what would you, if this scenario happens, would you be the one that gives? Well, then you have the gift of giving. Or, you know, if this person did this to you, would you be more apt to let them have it and tell them what's wrong? Or would you be more apt to forgive them? Oh, you may have the gift of mercy, or you're a prophet. And uh, they have the spiritual gifts test that determines, based on a person's personality, what their spiritual gifts is. The only problem with that, my friend, is a lost person could take the same test yeah. and uh, be assigned his position of a spiritual gift in the church. But when we talk about grace, we're talking about something that God has done. I don't know how many people, when they've shared their testimony with me, have said something along these lines, and you've probably heard it as well. I know many men, I know one man in particular, he said, you know, before I was saved, I never liked anyone. Everybody I ever met, I disliked him. He said, when I got saved, I liked everybody. Before I was saved, I fought, I was mean, and I had a problem with everybody there was. He said, when I got saved, I didn't have a problem with anybody, I loved everybody. He said, he said you know, it's just got to change. Well, what was that? Well, that would be God's grace, wouldn't it? Yeah. In other words, his personality was to pick at people, to find their faults, and to, you know, have, have a conflict with people. But God gave him his grace. Mm -hmm. And uh, he actually became a person who had been more prone to be merciful. And I don't know how many men I've met that said, you know, I didn't like people until I got saved. I, I, I have dear brothers. Uh, Brother Alex used to say this in our church. He used to say, if I weren't saved, I wouldn't be friends with any of you. <laughs> He's just like, yeah, I would. If I weren't saved, I wouldn't be friends with any of you. And he wasn't talking about it, he just didn't like us. But we were just so different. And truthfully, actually, if, if you know Brother Alex, you know he's like the, the, the guy everybody likes, Mr. Nice Guy. And uh, he didn't like everybody before he was saved. But he said, you know what, we're brothers. And as different as we are, as diverse as we are with regard to ethnicity, background, and uh, just personality, it's like we're best friends. We're family. Why? Well, because of what God did for us. You understand what we're saying about grace this morning? So the Bible says that we have gifts that are differing according to the grace that's given to us. If you have a spiritual gift, my friend, let me just say, let's begin with the understanding this morning that your spiritual gift isn't something you were born with with regard to a talent or an aptitude. Your spiritual gift is something that God supernaturally did in your life through the power of His Holy Spirit. And that's precious, isn't it? Oh, how many of us could testify that by God's grace we are where we did not think we could have been doing things we never would have been capable of? Mm -hmm. Isn't it so? You ever think about being a public speaker? I, I know so many. I, was re I read yesterday R.G. Letourneau's book on uh, he's a Christian businessman, developed a lot of equipment and so forth like that. Very interesting book. What is it? Uh, Mover of Men and Mountains, I think is the title of it. You've got to read it sometime if you have read it before. It's just a great biography of a Christian businessman. And uh, he, he talked a lot about you know God's uh, enabling him to do He said, I couldn't speak in public. He said, I couldn't pray in public. I couldn't get up and 
pray in public. And he became this person who went around the world and challenged Christians to live out their faith in, the, in, the, in, the, uh, in their daily lives. In other words, don't see yourself as not in the ministry just because you're not a preacher. And uh, he used to not be able to speak. He couldn't pray in public, couldn't sing in public, couldn't do anything in public. And then, by God's grace, became a very well-known public speaker. Well, how was that? Well, you know, when you get older, you just don't care anymore. You know, <laughs> No, God gave him grace to do something that he didn't have the ability to do. Listen, I have many times challenged and seen young men, and I just ask them, hey, could you teach a Sunday school class? And I, I know based on their personality and their background, I'd never do that. I can't exactly say that would be me, but it kind of would have been. To be honest with you, you say, well, Pastor, that explains why you're such a terrible speaker. Well, there are a lot of things that explain that, actually. But the reality of it is is that I couldn't be a pastor without God's grace. There's yes, for certain. It would be, I, I'll just be honest with you. My personality would be wrong. You say, it is wrong. Your personality is just wrong. Well, don't say that. It's not nice. Let's move on. Um, yeah. Then the Bible says, and we're going to look at this one first and only this morning, having then gifts differing according to the grace that's given to us, and now we're going to look at the different gifts outlined, whether prophecy, let us prophesy according to the proportion of faith. Now, a prophet would be an individual who would be endowed with the faculty of hearing uh, from God, or be a person who would have a special ability to uh, give God's word at, or could, to tell people what God intends or says from His word. Uh, as close as you could come to understand a New Testament prophet today, from looking at 1 Corinthians 13, where the Bible says, whether they be prophecies, there's tongues they shall seize, whether they be knowledge, which would be speaking of hearing specifically individually from God, it shall vanish away. We know that the prophecy of God's word is the prophecy that we have today. So if you're going to talk about a prophet today, a prophet would be somebody who understands and proclaims forth the Word of God. It's a preacher. Not just a... Uh, by the way, anyone... The preaching, by its very definition, involves the Gospel. It involves explaining to people that they're sinners, that Jesus died on the cross for their sins, was buried and rose again, and that salvation is simply receiving Jesus by faith, the work of the cross, where Jesus took their sin, died in their place, was buried and rose again, you can be risen with Jesus Christ. So the gospel is the death, burial, and resurrection. So every preacher preaches that. A preacher is a person who says, Thus saith the Lord, and challenges people to hear what God has said and to obey what God has said. And boy, you see, preacher, in Romans chapter 12, verse 1, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. Paul's preaching here even as he is giving us the prophecy of the Scripture. By the way, when you study the Scripture and you look at what uh, the Bible calls prophets and apostles, if you read Ephesians, one of the things you know is that the, the church is built on the cornerstone of Jesus Christ. If, if you know building, you know Pythagorean, right? Pythagorean theorem, three, four, five. Three this way, four this way equals five this way, and it will be completely square. Jesus is the cornerstone, that part that we square the church from. Christ is is our cornerstone. The foundation of the church, which is squared on, the, on Jesus Christ, is the apostles and the prophets. That's the way it's described in Ephesians. And the apostles and prophets, my friend, is this book. Amen. And so this is where we get right. the church. Jesus Christ and God's Word. This is our foundation. And from there, our spiritual gifts are how we do the ministry. Now, I've taken long enough to introduce the message this morning that if I were to preach anymore, you'd just keep on yawning and go back to sleep. I apologize to you for the people, whoever they are, that changed the time. I tried to find out last night when we went to bed last night. My wife said, who did it? Joel says it was Nixon, but uh, I think he did it Wednesday. Didn't? Can I get a witness? Joel said that Nixon did it. Uh, oh, Al said it. Okay, so Al said Nixon. Ben Franklin uh, came up well, Ben Franklin came up with the idea. the idea. Yeah, making he wrote a satire in France when he was uh, ambassador of France or something like that. He wrote a satire, a secret letter proposing changing the time in France. And then Adolf Hitler's the guy that first introduced it. It was Adolf Hitler that really started it off, and then everybody copied him. And uh, so we don't really know because it kind of ebbed and waned in the United States. But during World War One, we started doing time change. And then Nixon really ruined everything. So you know it was Nixon, you know, that he, he recorded somebody somewhere and stole their idea. I don't know what it was. Anyway, 
And then I think the millennials are the ones that are really promoting it today. Yeah. <laughs> Trump will fix it. <laughs> if, if America's ever made great again, <laughs> we'll have no more time change. <laughs> I'm trying to preach it now. We're talking about Donald Trump. It just doesn't fit, does it? Somehow. Stop it, Charlie. Quit distracting us. <laughs> okay, folks. We're going to look at in the next several weeks, we're going to look at spiritual gifts. And we're going to look at how it is that we as believers ought to know our spiritual gift, understand what it is, and then get involved with being living sacrifices. Now we're going to look at spiritual gifts. We're going to look at attitudes that we're supposed to have with each other as believers. So that will be the next two weeks. Next week we're going to look at spiritual gifts. And the week after that we're going to look at the way that we're supposed to behave among each other as a Christian. And as, as we conclude our message this, this morning, let me just remind you of what's happening at the church at Rome. There is a dissimulation in the church. The Bible says love is to be without dissimulation. But there is a dissimulation. There are individuals who are Jewish and they're holding against the Gentiles that they're not Jewish. There are Gentiles who are saying, oh, we're right about not being saved by the law. And so you Jews in your faith, you're no, and they're both, you know what it really comes down to? Is they don't really love each other the way they ought to. Yes. They don't really have the, the attitude they ought to have and they don't... They're not, they're not a living sacrifice. And so we're going to take all the doctrinal things we've learned so far in Romans. In the next couple of weeks, we're going to learn how to practice what we've learned. Everything you believe, my friend, has a behavior that comes from it. You know that's true? It's amazing. The Bible says about false teachers, by their fruits you shall know them. Why? Because what you believe has a behavior that comes from it. And that's any kind of false teacher any kind of false teaching, not simply the one that you disagree with. That would be anything that isn't what God says. I want to ask by way uh, of closing our service, I don't feel led to have a come forward invitation or go backward invitation as it more likely is in our service this morning. But I want to ask that you would commit to the Lord that you would be willing to be a living sacrifice. And that you would understand that not only is it your reasonable service, but that this matter of knowing spiritual gifts, understanding by God's grace what He's doing in you, is vitally important to the body as well as the mindset or the attitude through which you serve in the body of Jesus Christ. How do you see yourself? How do you perceive yourself? Do you look at the church like some people do and and uh, say it this way, your church, to somebody else instead of being our church? It, 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 it uh, troubles me sometimes when people in our church say your church to me. This isn't mine. This, this church is, we're, we're part of the body and we belong to Jesus. It's our reasonable service to be what we are. The assets of this church do not belong to me. The, the office of the pastor is something that I've been called to serve in. But it's not a, there's no lordship here. There's no, uh, as far as from a, from a man or from a person. This is our body. But we ought to understand how vitally and important it is for what God is doing throughout the body for us to know what we are in this body. That's right. And if you would commit to the Lord and say, God, you know what, I want to know what you're doing. I want to make sure based on the Word of God that I'm not conformed to this world. I'm transformed. By the way, what a wonderful message about being transformed by the renewing of your mind. God, I think that in some ways I'm more in tune with what's going on and happening in the world than I am with what's happening in your program, the church. And I'm committed. I'm committed to being open to what the Holy Spirit says to me seeing you do great things. I believe this with all my heart, friend. I believe that if this church, the small group that's here this morning, this small crowd here this morning, if this group of individuals would get serious about Romans chapter 12 and being what God wants them to be, I believe we could literally reach the world for Jesus Christ. That's right. Amen. God can do great things by His grace and we need His power. And that's what we're going to focus on. How can we have God's grace in our church? Father, thank you for what you've helped us to understand by way of introduction this morning, and I ask that you would increase it in our hearts. Lord, would you give us a longing to see supernatural ability, supernatural power, that which is not humanly explained? And God, could it be us that you use to do these things with? Lord, I pray that you would give us a yearning desire to know your word. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thanks for your good attention this morning, especially on Time Change Sunday. You folks are the you know, I would say uh, the cream of the crop, if you will. But you woke up on Time Change Sunday. Let me just share one last, before I dismiss everybody, one last little antidote about my morning. I got up an hour late this morning.
I know you don't believe it, but that's why everything was such a mess here today. <laughs> the parking lot's not blown and all these other things because I only got here in time to drop off my wife and then I had to go down and do some picking up and so forth. But uh, I want to apologize to you for things not being everything they should have been starting on time for Sunday school and so forth this morning. And I can't explain, I mean, I know it was my cell phone's fault, um, because that's where my alarm is. This really is something I'm battling, this technology thing. I think I'm getting old, and I know so because technology is my enemy, not my friend anymore. Uh, you know, the, you saw the guys this morning before Sunday school fighting the computers. And, you know, my computer screen, this is it right here, it's, it's smashed. And uh, I probably could get a new one, but I don't want one. You know, I'm just, yeah. it's, uh, it's one of those things where <laughs> I just, we're enemies. So, I don't know when it happened, but a long time ago, something got set on a cell phone that I had. Now the cell phone's all synced to turn my alarm on silent. And somehow, I could figure it out if I if I love technology enough. But somehow, it turns my I, I could check my alarm. It can be on volume, and then it syncs with Google, and Google turns my alarm on silent again. That happened this morning. I woke up this morning because it was seven o'clock normally. But it was 8 o'clock <laughs> this morning. I never slept in that late on Sunday, and I don't know how long. So I apologize to you, but I promise I won't take a nap this afternoon. Everything will be ready this evening if the traffic allows it when you get here. Thank you so much for being here. I love you, and count it a privilege to be your pastor. You're dismissed.